Today we're testing out 12 volt server rack batteries. So instead of building a large battery bank with small 12 volt batteries, you can just throw these into your RV, your van, your boat, pretty much anywhere you have a 12 volt system. I personally hate 12 volts, but this is a lot better than a lot of options on Amazon. Um, a lot of the cheap Chinese relabeled 12 volt 100 amp hour batteries are pretty much the same exact battery and they have the same features. This one has the same features as some of the expensive server rack batteries, but at a fraction of the cost. These are actually cheaper than a lot of the cheap Amazon batteries. So first off, the capacity is 400 amp hours each. So that means we have five kilowatt hours over here and five kilowatt hours over here. So on my table with these two batteries, we have 10 kilowatt hours. And that's the same capacity as eight Battleborn batteries. So imagine eight Battleborn batteries and wiring them together in parallel so that they will not have current sharing problems. Compared to this, you just connect them with two cables and then you do a diagonal configuration so you avoid current sharing issues and you're done. It is a lot easier. Next, the output of each battery is 200 amps continuous, and they recommend a constant charge current of 100 amps each. That means that each battery can support an inverter output of 2,500 watts each. So if you have a 5,000 watt inverter, you're gonna have to have at least two of these batteries connected in parallel. Next, the charging current is recommended at 100 amps. So that means 1,260 watts can go into each battery. If you have a solar panel array on your RV that's 2,000 watts, you're gonna have to buy two of these batteries minimum. You can actually charge these up to 200 amps, but they do not recommend that to increase the cycle life count. Now let's talk about how long these batteries should last for. Each one has a rated service life of 10 years, but even after 10 years, you'll have some degradation and reduce capacity but you can safely use them now these batteries with the cells that they're using are rated to 7,000 cycles if you do a depth of discharge of 80 percent so that means cycling from 100 down to 20 percent and then back up again you're going to get 7,000 cycles if you do 100 percent depth of discharge typically you're going to get 5,000 cycles but that's only to 80 percent capacity you can safely use these batteries well after that point it is not like a lead acid battery where when it dies it's dead and that's it you have to replace it these ones will have capacity fade over time but you can safely use these well after that no problem next the pro model has its own circuit breaker so you can connect this directly to your system or to an inverter as long as the cable that you're using can carry the current to trip this breaker so typically with these large batteries I would put a 4 aught gauge cable especially at 12 volts but this one does not have a circuit breaker, but it does have overcurrent protection by the BMS that is built inside. But a lot of people will sleep better at night adding their own fuse and treating this just like any other 12 volt battery. So that is one benefit of the Pro model and it saves you time when you're installing your system. Next, the communication ports on the front, the Pro model has more. We have CAN bus, RS-485, and battery comms. Over here, we only have RS-485 for battery to battery communication. Now, both of these batteries use the EG4 protocol. So if you buy an EG4 inverter, this will communicate with very minimal work. You just plug in the cables, you set the settings and you're good to go. And each battery has a state of charge indicator with these LED lights. So right now it shows that it's at 75% state of charge. Next, we have the main positive and negative terminals. This is where you connect your loads or chargers. And to turn this battery on, we turn the on and off button, and then we wait for the screen to load. And it shows the voltage, the current, and the state of charge. And then after you're done connecting your loads and chargers, then you can flip on the breaker switch, and then these terminals will be live. Now on this battery, you have an on and off switch, and that will make the terminals live. So be sure to connect your inverters and chargers before you turn it on. So anyways, you understand the basics. There's server rock batteries and they're at 12 volts. So let's connect these chargers and charge them up to 100%. Now we're charging with 72 amps over here and almost 70 amps over here. So we'll come back in a couple hours when these are fully charged. Guys, these cables are undersized. This thing is super hot. 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is why I dislike 12 volts. I haven't used it in a while. The amount of current required for 12 volt systems is astronomical in my opinion. I hope we can replace 12 volt with 48 volts soon because I do not like this. I am not a patient person. So we're gonna charge this battery up first 
so we can test it with an inverter, then we'll charge that one up later. And I bet that terminal is going to get pretty hot. Actually, not that bad. It says 129. So you know what? I think this copper is wicking away some of this heat because this one's a lot hotter than this one. So yeah, it's actually taking some of that heat away from the terminal. And it's decreasing. We're at 110 now. That's cool. I love science, man. That's awesome. Yeah, this feels cooler. Now I can actually touch it. That is so cool. Now, even with 140 amps going into these batteries, they're so large that this is still a 0.35C rate. So it's pretty safe to do. But they still recommend only 100 amps. So we'll come back in like an hour and it should be fully charged this time. So the current is falling and it's practically at 100%. So we're going to hook it up to an inverter and do a max output test. And this is a 4,000 watt inverter. Now typically I use a pre-charge resistor, but this thing has a pre-charge resistor circuit built in. So we're going to connect it first and then we're going to turn it on. And these cables can easily handle 200 amps. So we're going to turn the battery on and then we'll turn the inverter on. And now we can add a load. We need to output 200 amps. So that's 2,500 watts. So this is 1,500 watts. 230 amps. Actually, let's see what happens. 260 oh it turned off so it actually works so we're going to turn it off and then turn it back on again sometimes it doesn't work so that was a really good test and we have power oh 200 amps that's perfect and we're going to time this to see how long it can run it for now this load will run for two hours, so I'm going to come back in a little while. It's been an hour and a half, and we're still pulling 200 amps. We are at two hours, and it is still running the load, and the current has increased. We're at 216 amps. Oh, and it turned off. Look at that! That was almost exactly two hours. That is funny. So it actually passed the test. The hottest temperature is 127 degrees Fahrenheit and 125 degrees Fahrenheit over here. Now we're going to open this battery up and see what's inside and see if anything got too hot or if there's a bad connection or anything else. <laughs> Crazy to see such a large low voltage battery. I can touch any of this. Look at this. No risk of shock and yeah, I'm not used to that. Yeah, the BMS is hot. 154 degrees Fahrenheit is the max temperature. These heat sinks are a little tricky because they reflect. But the terminals and bus bars look great. There's no hot spots at all. Yeah, pretty uniform distribution of heat. What is interesting is it's a very different design than their 48 volt servo rack batteries. Those look totally different, like how the cells are put together, even the strapping methods for putting the cells into the packs. And this is a higher current BMS because obviously it has to handle double the current of the 48 volt model. There's a fire arrestor in the 12 volt life power as well. I thought that was only in the more expensive model. Yeah, look at that. And these trigger the fire arrestor. And it's a little hard to see, but it's a small black box. And there's one over here as well. And it has a massive pre-charge resistor on the top when that circuit is triggered. In pretty typical build quality, I don't see any difference compared to the other server rack batteries. Um, it does have this big metal shelf right here that holds the cells down. But yeah, they are in there pretty darn good. And these are welded cells to these bus bars, so you can't really service these like an SOK battery. I was hoping we could find some hot spots on the bus bar that connects to the main terminal, but I'm not feeling anything. Any of these conductors, they're all the same temperature. And here's a close-up shot. So here's the voltage sensing leads. This is a 4S configuration, so you only have five of them. Um, one right here, one right there, one right there one right there, and then one right there. We're using seven gauge 200 C rated wire for the connection between the bus bar and the main terminal. Now let's move on to the pro version or the V2. We're gonna open up that battery after we do a discharge test. Now I wonder, will the circuit breaker trip first or the BMS for overcurrent protection? So we're gonna use our large inverter, put a large load on it and see which one's triggered first. But first we're gonna turn it off. 
and then turn the circuit breaker on so that we can run the pre-charge resistor circuit. And that will charge up the capacitors inside the inverter. Actually, let's test the pre-charge resistor circuit. We're gonna go get a meter for that. So this meter measures inrush. So if there's a large amount of current that goes through these cables to charge up these capacitors, we'll catch it. So the breaker is in the on position. So now we can turn the battery on. 12 amps, is that it? So it actually worked, it reduced the current to 12 amps. If that circuit was not there, it would be in the hundreds of amps and it could damage the battery's BMS. So let's add a load and see which one trips, the breaker or the BMS. 211, let's see if this trips it up. And it's not. So let's increase the current. This breaker is 125 amps and there's two of them. So 250 amp breaker. So yeah, I think the BMS is gonna catch this way before this thing trips. Let's increase it. Oh, there we go, yep. And as you can see, the breaker did not trip. The BMS did first. Let's try that again. And we're back. 214 amps, so let's increase it again. Let's increase it fast so we can try to trip the breaker. So I'm gonna do full output. 370, oh God, I hate this. Oh my God, it's running, what the heck? Why is it not tripping? Those thermal breakers always scare me. The breaker is not tripping, oh, okay. Yeah, it was not enough time for this thermal breaker to trip, so the BMS tripped even at high current or low current. So really, this acts as a disconnect. It's pretty much an on and off switch. It's not necessarily good for the overcurrent. If the BMS were to fail and a FET were to short, this could be triggered, but under most circumstances, the BMS will trip first. Oh, look at that! Guys, guess what? It is the same battery. It has the fire arresters, the same BMS, but look at this massive DC rated circuit breaker. It is gargantuan. And the communication board and the screen is obviously its own separate board. So there are some differences, but overall it's practically the same battery. I think this one actually has a better warranty though. They also have this as a 24 volt battery if you guys want one of those. 10 year warranty for this one and five year warranty for the budget model. So for the other one, it's half as long for the warranty. So you're really paying for the warranty, this nice little screen and the communication options if you have an inverter that uses that like a CAN bus or something. And the DC rated circuit breaker, but this is not gonna trip under most circumstances. The BMS will catch it first. These are the same cells. This is the same number on the other pack. So yeah, I mean, they look identical. If you look at them, they are pretty much carbon copies except for that little screen in the breaker. The pre-charge resistor is actually in a different location. On the other one, it's on the front plate over here, but over here it's mounted right next to the fire arrestor on its own plate. How did I not notice this? This was right in front of my face the whole time. These are six gauge conductors instead of three seven gauge conductors. So instead of having another one right here because of the circuit breaker and how it connects, they only have two. So that means you have 100 amps going through each conductor. Technically, I have seen the charts from these companies and this 200C rated wire can do it, but some people would prefer having three conductors instead. And the connections to the circuit breaker are nice and solid. They have ferrules for each one. Everything feels pretty darn tight. Yeah, and they also glue them and torque them and they even mark them with a the marker. So they are doing their job for the quality control or quality assurance, I mean. Now something I did not test is the fire arresters. This is lithium iron phosphate though, so even in a thermal runaway, it's not even hot enough to catch a piece of paper on fire. So these are pretty much as safe as like a big stack of wood. The electrolyte is flammable if it gets hot enough, but you'd have to get this thing very hot. You'd have to literally throw it into a fire to make it catch on fire. It's not gonna ever spontaneously combust or combust on its own or have a self-propagating combustible reaction. Like for example, NCA or a lithium polymer battery or NMC. These are totally different. Now I understand it sounds pretty silly that they're putting fire arresters in a lithium iron phosphate battery, but that's to conform to certain UL standards or codes of compliance for certain types of electrical equipment. So they have that in there for a reason. So to test these long term, we're actually gonna build a system out of these. And I'm gonna build a 12 volt system for the first time in probably a year, and we're gonna see how well they perform. Overall, it's still a server rack battery, so I'm expecting it to work really well. The number one thing that I did wanna test is if the breaker would trip first 
or the BMS in high current situations and it did pass that test. It actually triggered really well in both of them. And by instantly, I mean a few seconds. These thermal breakers take quite a while sometimes to actually trip. Now let's talk about the downsides. First off, it has limited output current. If you have four Battleborns in parallel, you're gonna be able to output 400 amps. This one can only do 200 amps. So you're gonna to have to buy more batteries to run the same loads. But for most people, you'll be fine with one or two. And most people are gonna buy that many anyways, so I don't think this is that big of a constraining factor unless you're trying to make a very, very small battery to run large loads. There are some 100 amp hour batteries, like the Lion Energy one that can output 150 amps. And then there's the AO Lithium that can output 200 amps from a 100 amp hour battery. So these are not for that. These are specifically for solar at a lower C rate. Next downside is these are not sealed for marine use. If you wanna use these, you're gonna to have to build a box around it that's watertight. Next downside is it might be harder to mount these because there's only these pieces right here that you can really mount to. The rest of it is just a big metal box and you can't really screw into it. It would be nice if they had mounting plates on the side and little L brackets that you could attach to it. That would make it really easy. And this is a very big deal with 12 volt systems because most of them are for mobile application for RVs, vans, and boats. So when you tie these down, you're probably gonna use some straps, some double-sided tape, like anything you can to hold down this 100 pound brick. Because if you're in an accident, these things could fly all over the place and rip the wires off and I've seen it and I've done it. So yeah, you have to make sure that these are strapped down really good. Next downside is the shipping cost. Um, if you buy a single battery, it's gonna cost a lot for shipping. But if you buy multiple batteries, especially for your friends, it's gonna get the price of shipping very low. Next downside, but this applies to all batteries, is these terminals need to be more protected. It would be so nice if they had a cover on top of this that could connect to like a Victron, a Lynx distributor, and then it would be a nice clean install. But these are pretty darn exposed and they stick out a lot. If they were recessed, like the ground connection over here, it would be a lot more protected. So think about that when you're installing these batteries. And that's pretty much all I can think of. There's not a whole lot here. It is a box of cells with a BMS and this one has a screen. So yeah, not a lot going on. Now let's do a price comparison of these batteries versus other 12 volt batteries on the market. So first off, a Battleborn battery for a 12 volt 100 amp hour today, I checked the website this morning, it's $874. For an SOK battery, which I've been recommending for a long time, it's $559. For an Ampere time, it's $350. And for a Ridodo, which used to be some other weird name that they had for that company, it's $320. These come in at $362 right here. And for this one, $400. $137. And for the features compared to those cheap batteries, this one blows them away. I think this is the best value 12 volt battery that's currently available. None of those have circuit breakers, communication, state of charge indicators, screen, any of this. They are just a battery all by themselves. Some of them do have Bluetooth, but most of them do not have low temperature charging protection. And both of these batteries have five temperature sensors total. There's four for the cells, one that's ambient temperature sensor, and one for the MOSFETs. And all of those other ones do not have any of that except for one on the MOSFET for over temperature protection. Now the next step in testing is long-term testing and seeing if anybody on the forums has any issues with these batteries. I have I have noticed that most of the complaints for EG4 is for their inverters in the software and trying to update the firmware, but a lot of people do not complain about their batteries at all. I've been running six of their batteries without issue in my lab for over a year now, every single day, so that's been pretty cool. So I think you're good to go with these batteries. If you think I'm missing something or if you have any issues with these batteries at all, please post it on the forum so that we can all see and please provide evidence, photos, videos, um, everything you possibly can if you're having any problems with these batteries and I'll share it in my next video. And that's pretty much it, a big 12 volt battery. And now I'm gonna build a 12 volt system. Um, I'm gonna try to make it as beginner friendly as possible, but it's really 
really hard for me to go from 48 volts to 12 volts because now I have to mess with these massive cables. On my other system, I do 13,000 watts with the same size cable as what goes on these. You see what I'm talking about? It's crazy. So 12 volt, in my opinion, is harder to build with. It, it takes a lot more time and equipment and more cost and everything else. But yeah, we'll build it and we'll test it. So thank you so much for watching and please let me know what you think in the comments section below and I will see you in the next video. Bye.